Well, thanks. Thank you all uh, for coming. Thanks to the Gilmore's for sponsoring this. And thank you, Kurt, for um, contributing to this um, discussion of, uh, of Asia and the pivot with a, a really terrific book. Um, Kurt and I were trying to figure out how to structure this. The first proposal was we were just going to spend an hour giving you stories from fishing trips we've taken together, but we were afraid that you would all be hitting the elevators a little bit earlier than we had in mind and wouldn't have believed Jonathan's part about serious people and serious discussion. So we've decided to spare you uh, that. Uh, I'm willing to fill you in any time later with pictures. Um, and Kurt, instead I want to do... Um, turn first to the book and the challenge that's left. So you may have noticed we have this little presidential election mm -hmm. underway uh, here. And um, the next president who comes along, uh, whoever, whether that is Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, or whether the libertarians get their first swing inside the White House, uh, are going to um, face two immediate challenges in Asia that will seem highly urgent, and then <clears throat> a series of long-term ones which you go into. So let's start with the urgent and we'll move on to the long-term. The two, <coughs> pardon me, the two urgent are going to be um, a China whose activities we kind of mis, um, misguessed when Xi Jinping came in. Uh, whose actions in the South China Sea have been significantly more aggressive than many people had suspected, uh, that, um, that both candidates seem to have troubles with for different reasons. And then a North Korea that has had one of the most active years uh, that it possibly could have in both uh, nuclear and missile testing and is now achieving enough success that the next president is going to be able to afford a let's sit back and see how this plays out approach. So um, tell us first what you think the right way to approach those two will be, and then let's turn that into how that fits into the broader strategy of the pivot. Great. Thank you. Uh, first of all, David, thank you for uh, hosting this, and thanks to the Aspen Institute and Jonathan in particular, a great uh, – director of the strategy group has just done a great job. Uh, Jim, who helps run all the uh, public affairs and the engagement of the Aspen Institute, and my old friend Willow Darcy, who I had a chance to work with when I was uh, helping uh, support the Aspen strategy group. So um, uh, let me answer your question, David, but let me begin with just a larger framing where you began as well. So we are in the midst of you know, one of the most challenging and controversial election, election seasons uh, of our memory, of our lives. And we should be under no illusions about what some of the challenges that has created abroad, right? So if you, if you travel, particularly in Asia, and you ask yourself, ask Asian interlocutors, what are you concerned by? And as an American, you think, well, you're going to hear a lot about a rising China, uh, questions about along the lines that David has laid out about uh, ambitions and provocations. You're going to hear you anticipate a lot about North Korea, uh, uh, North Korea who seems bent on provocation. Uh, you think you're going to hear concerns about um, uh, political instability in parts of Southeast Asia, uh, concerns about uh, you know uh, the extent uh, and prospects of climate change, which most studies suggest will affect Asia perhaps more than any other region. And so that's what you anticipate, but as you travel through Asia, particularly in this period, the number one issue that you're going to hear is concerns about the United States. And those concerns, um, and I think David alluded to them, are not going to go away um, the day after the election. Now, I, I have a favored candidate, uh, and one of the things I've tried to say is no matter what, we have a huge amount of work to do in the immediate aftermath to reassure Asians and others about the purpose and continuity of American leadership in the world. And so I think there is a sense that the, you know, the tectonics are shifting in the United States and Asians are, per, per, you know, peculiarly and specifically uh, attuned to this. And so they know there are now bigger questions about alliances, 
about our commitment to regimes like nonproliferation, our support for trade, uh, issues related to defense spending, all of those things are being deba debated in our body politic in a way that I think has unnerved Asian interlocutors. So, so the first job, in addition to what David has ably laid out, is really to make a strong and durable um, uh, set of statements and actions that indicate that the that this foundational role that the United States has played will continue going forward. To David's specific points, I think the most urgent issues, I, I would have thought that you would have put China in the longer term, it is both, has presents urgent and it does. longer it term does. issues. But I think the issue that you laid out at at, at the outset, David, about North Korea is undeniable. What we have seen are a series of steps, uh, the fifth nuclear test, um, some missile uh, uh, testing uh, during the G20 of all places, the, the prized Chinese gathering um, uh, earlier this year and the North Koreans determined to launch during that gathering, right? Their number one really their only patron on the global stage. I think we've got to recognize quite clearly that previous efforts um, um, have failed. Uh, diplomacy, uh, uh, some sanctions, and I think we need to, uh, David, have a, a whole scale relook at the way forward. Now my particular position would be that there is a common misperception um, you've seen a, there's a very good piece in the New York Times, David's newspaper, uh, by Senator Nunn and Jane Harmon, both members of the strategy group, arguing that we've tried sanctions and that they have failed. I would take a different view. I believe that, that basically North Korea is relatively lightly sanctioned. And that if you compare the sanction regimes that we've used against Iran, against Cuba, uh, and even Myanmar, much more intense. And I think we have to think carefully about targeted uh, financial sanctions that will um, essentially hold at risk two to 3,000 of the elite that basically um, are sustained by certain kinds of international interactions. But Kurt, let me just uh, press you on that, because with Iran, you know, society that had a lot of big banking relationships across the world. There were a lot of different ways to get at them. To do serious sanctions on North Korea means going after with second, primary and secondary sanctions the Chinese banks that are keeping them going. Yeah. And you've, that's going to create a problem with China that is going to spread into other regions. That's why everybody's been reluctant to do it. I, I, I agree with that, David. I, and I, I also believe that, that a the watchword of what we've tried to accomplish diplomatically is working constructively and cooperatively with China on the North Korea problem. Um, and we've had some successes, but I think we've reached a stage now where what we are experiencing is not only the potential for North Korea to create regional unrest mm -hmm. in Northeast Asia, but this now poses an extens existential challenge to the United States. So we're in a very different world in which we're going to have to, I, I, and, and I'm not saying that we would dictate. Mm -hmm. I would recommend that we go and, and explain, you know. To the Chinese that this is existential to us and, in, and, in and, a way that and, it was not before. And help us with these financial sanctions. But if not, if we can't do it together, we'll be prepared to do it alone. Let me ask you about, because uh, the sections you write on North Korea are so fascinating in the, in the book, and we'll turn to China in a bit, but... I think it's fair to say that through the Bush administration and through the first term of the Obama administration, the time that you were uh, Assistant Secretary for East Asia, the official line of the U.S. government was and remains that the purpose of sanctions is to denuclearize, get, get into a negotiation in which the denuclearization of the uh, Korean Peninsula was the, was the ultimate objective. And the North Korea had to go into it understanding and stating that that's what the goal of this negotiation was. I think whoever the next president is, is may have to go revise that view and say the North Koreans are fundamentally uninterested in trading away their nuclear program for economic integration and access. At this point, to them, it's about regime survival. 
which means either we're going to be in a position of negotiating with them with the idea that they would be able to retain something, something the United States has always said we would never go do, or we have to go into it with the thought that if the negotiation fails, they will one way or another be denuclearized. Is that a fair assessment? First of all, I would agree with you that asking the question and reviewing the experience is going to be an important dimension. I, I also think that we need to recognize that we're in an environment where there has been loose talk in our own election campaigns about non-proliferation issues and whether other countries should build uh, nuclear weapons. I, I don't well, it's think it's been a limited amount. There's been loose talk by one yeah, candidate. Yeah, uh, in, in, in <laughs> by association groups, nonpartisan. Trying right, to be careful here. Right. So I, I think for uh, anybody who needs to be clued in on this, um, uh, Mr. Trump said, including in an interview with me. Uh, actually, I think he started with an interview with right. me that he was okay if Japan and South Korea got their own and retained their own nuclear arsenals if the United States decided that they could no longer um, pay the burden of defending them. And so I, I think the the non-proliferation bargain is more perilous in Asia than perhaps any other place, with many countries having the technological capability and who have flirted with the prospects in the past. And so I don't think we have as much flexibility on the end of of uh, you know a wink and nod towards North Korea as many people have suggested. I also think, David, uh, underlying your question is a larger worry of about an increasingly erratic North Korea that is contemplating steps and actions that are deeply antithetical to the maintenance of peace and stability. And so I think as much of this as anything else is to demonstrate very clearly the limits of what um, the United States and other countries, particularly China, will allow. Now, what, what has been often described when you talk about, uh, you know, this kind of, you know, approach, you'll often hear people say, no, no, you're just outsourcing the problem to China. That, that's not it at all. I mean, the United States has a central critical role to play, as does South Korea. In fact, South Korea has to take a more leadership role, and we support that going forward. This is about appropriately understanding your leverage and using it. This is unacceptable to the United States. And we have to, we, we were prepared in Iran to move against Western financial institutions. You, you covered it very well, David. Huge numbers of firms in Britain and France and elsewhere faced sanctions and penalty, our closest allies. And so why were we unwilling to do that in the case of North Korea with a much more advanced nuclear program? I, look, um, I think it is undeniable that the level of focus and intensity on Iran um, uh, uh, has been greater than any other diplomacy of its kind. Um, I believe that the next turn will involve a kind of very formidable effort on the part of the United States mm -hmm. that um, uh, indeed steps up substantially pressure on North Korea. And, and part of that is going to be a, a, a clear conversation with Chinese friends about what's at stake here. So one of the most fascinating parts of the book, apart from the hilarious scene where you're um, running and sweating and discarding things you've swiped off of Air Force One before you get in the president's limousine. Not, not limousine. my finest hour. But, yeah. so. <laughs> but you're most amusing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, but, uh, and, and there are, there are wonderful self-deprecating scenes throughout the book that you should, um, uh, Go read, and we'll fill you in on some more you didn't put in. Uh, but um, the uh, one of the most fascinating explorations in the book is how the Chinese see the pivot. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, so first of all, just at the outset, the United States and China must live together. I mean, there's just no question about this. Um, we are destined to be intertwined. No two countries experience um, uh, interconnectedness uh, more. No two countries are more uncomfortable in some respects with, um, uh, uh, with this mutual uh, uh, relationship of vulnerability. And so I would begin by saying that that is our guide going forward, that we need to 
a structure or relationship that is based on the concept that the United States and China can coexist, must coexist, and that Asia is big enough for the both of us. Um, I think um, there will be enormous challenges in that process, David, and we're entering a period in which there is inevitably going to be tension in the U.S.-China relationship on a whole host of issues, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's maritime issues, um, uh, there will be uh, uh, areas where the United States and China are contesting. But there also will be areas of cooperation that are substantial. And I think sometimes those areas of cooperation are, um, are misunderstood or do not receive enough attention. The steps that the United States and China took in the um, aftermath of the global financial crisis in 2007, 2008, were very substantial in helping stabilize the global economy. We took those steps, both of us, for our own best strategic interests, but there was also a degree of coordination. David, we've also talked about Iran. Um, the, um, the most important sanctions efforts that were put in place um, likely came from China. In, in this effort and we're absolutely central in bringing a purposeful effort, multilateral effort and pressure to bear on Iran. We coordinated very closely with Chinese friends around the opening to Myanmar to make clear that this was not some, you know, a piece on a chessboard, you know, aimed against China, but a very different um, uh, kind of effort on the part of the United States. We have tried to work together on North Korea with only limited success. And of course, we've seen a degree of coordination um, uh, on climate change, which I believe is going to be the most important effort for the 21st century. At the core of this, though, I think is about American purpose. And I believe at the outset of the Clinton administration, I think there were questions in China about whether the United States had the staying power and capacity to maintain its role in the Asia Pacific region. And I think there is a very substantial cottage industry in China about, it's not just in China, by the way, it's across Asia, about American decline. The idea that the United States is in a nosedive of decline that is going to animate Asia. And I think that those sentiments are much more pervasive in Asia than perhaps in any other region of the world. Um, and the Chinese, the Chinese had this big time big five time. or six years ago. Yeah. I get the sense when I talk to Chinese officials now, they're beginning to revise their view as they run into some slowdown issues and they're trying to figure yeah. out why they can't replicate the innovative capabilities of this economy. It, it, and what's interesting, David, is that this is not a new phenomenon in Asia. About at least six times in the last 40 years, there has been a very serious entertaining of the idea of a hurtling American decline. We had it at the, the end the of... The Japanese did it in the yeah, late 80s, yeah, big time. The, and, then, and we had it at the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, the late Lee Kuan Yew uh, basically gave speeches about the demise of American power. There is a tendency to underestimate the hidden strengths and the you know, kind of the distinguishing features of a durable the United States, the points that we make right now, by the way, to try to dispel some of the concerns that you hear in Asia more generally. But I will say those who have bet against the United States in the last 40 or 50 years have lost a lot of money in Asia. And I, I would not write us off. And I think the pivot really, David, was about reinforcing, look, the United States has a very strong position in Asia. Um, I think there was a little unfortunate back and forth between some who said, aha, we're back in Asia, and others that said, oh, we've never left, right? I, I would actually take issue with both of those schools of thought. So for us to be back in Asia is going to require a number of administrations and a substantial investment of time and attention and money during a period where there are really pressing other issues in Europe, in the Middle East, and elsewhere, right? So it's, it's, gonna, it's not one administration. It's a succession, and it's a bipartisan commitment. On the other hand, those who said, oh, we've never left, I, I disagree with that. I believe that there was a period after 9-11 of relatively substantial stri strategic neglect. Now, my friends in the Bush administration really are unhappy with that. They say that's not true. 
yes, I think there was very strong working relationships that were sustaining our efforts in Asia. But at the strategic level, at the leadership level, the scarcest resource in government, David, is the time and attention of our leadership. And I think what we've had for almost 15 years is at a time that it is undeniable that the lion's share of the history of the 21st century is going to be written in Asia. Whether we like it or not, we have spent a huge amount of our time on the Middle East and South Asia. Well, I think so, that's demonstrably... Yeah, and so know. the key is to try to figure out how we responsibly rebalance or pivot or reshape American commitments, time, and attitude, not just in government, but in business, across the board, to recognize the 21st so century. So let's talk a little bit about how the Obama administration did on this. So in the first term, you lay out this agenda, and you were a critical architect of this. Secretary Clinton obviously played a very big role, was there a lot. I would say she was in Asia significantly more than Secretary Kerry has, has spent time uh, uh, in Asia. Um, the president obviously got deeply involved, and Tom Donilon is national security advisor and many others. The rap on the pivot was that come the second term, coincidentally after you left, um, uh, that the focus on the various elements of the pivot began to get much more diffuse. The military part of it kept going because it involved buying some hardware, planning about moving people, and that's you know, largely in train. But all of those other elements that you talked about, the diplomatic surge that would have to go with it, um, the business surge that would have to go with it, the constant discussion of it by the president so that it was drummed in to various constituencies that this was his reconception of how America would distribute its power and its attention didn't happen. So that's the common rap. Do you believe that? You know, David, I, I, I think, you know, I've heard the critique, obviously. I, I actually think much more has happened than has um, uh, been properly understood. And I also think it puts the president in a very difficult position because when he articulates the, you know, kind of the, the, the pull or the responsibilities necessary for a greater Asia focus, I think some people will turn around and say, but yes, but what about Syria? What about and so they're often juxtaposed against Which is exactly what happened in the Bush administration. Yeah, yeah. so and I'm not I'm not disagreeing that, but I would also say I think the president has done uh, a good job at articulating a vision of where he wants to take the United States. I think he, of all people, would say it's unfinished business and more needs mm -hmm. to be done. I think he would have liked to have done more, frankly. But I think um, you know there are things that have taken place that I would have that I hoped for, but never in my wildest dreams thought we would achieve. So Myanmar being one? Well, I mean, yes, Myanmar, but I mean, things that would seem very small to you, but let mm -hmm. me give you an example. Sure. So when the president, um, uh, first of all, some of the marine sanctuary issues are hugely important in terms of the, the, um, the lifeblood of the Pacific, which is the health of the oceans, the steps that he's taken on climate change. When he went to Hawaii, um, he had a meeting with all the Pacific Island leaders. Now you're going to say, well, who cares? Th this is a place where our forefathers fought and died. We have huge moral historical responsibilities. No president had ever met with the Pacific Island leaders. Um, and the fact that he took time and, and sat down and talked about how we could extend support and aid and assistance and fishing and the like um, was significant. He's also done much more in Southeast Asia than any president really since the Vietnam War. And, and a good part of the rebalance is not, you know, I, the mistake we made, and I, I have to lay a lot of that blame on myself, is this idea that we were somehow going to abandon Europe um, uh, for Asia is a huge problem. Um, and, and that lies largely, if any of you know how government works, 99 times out of 100, when you come up with an initiative and you roll it out, it immediately disappears. It's not covered by David Sanger. No one cares. <laughs> you point to it and they go, well, what are you talking about? This is not important, right? That one time where it takes off and then there are unintended consequences and you're answering questions that you did not anticipate, for me, that was that, this experience. And so 
everything that the United States has done ever of significance on the global stage, we've done with Europe. And that will continue to be the case. And in fact, the only countries that are pivoting much more rapidly to Asia than the United States are in Europe. And so the, our, the idea was to articulate why we needed to work more on these issues. But I think some of that got lost uh, more generally in the translation. So what I, I've now diverted and got it. So what was the specific okay. question? So, so, so th the question is that this overall rap was that they lost yeah. their focus. And you can understand just why like this, I just did there. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And I think now we see why it happened. Yeah, why, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, it's terrible. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, the president clearly hoped in the second term he would be out of Iraq, he would be largely out of Afghanistan, and that he could take some of the resources, including the intellectual and time resources, to go focus on Asia. Not the way the world works. Syria blew up. He happened to be unlucky enough to be the president at the time the Arab Spring happened and its aftermath. Uh, we had put more troops into uh, Iraq. We had to, we we're going to have to stay around in Afghanistan for a longer period of time. So it is possible to argue that events just didn't work out the way it looked like it would in the first term. The question is, um, did they lose an opportunity here, and can you make it up? I, look, I, I think the pro I, I look at it differently, dude. I think the process has begun. In some cases, the kinds of support that are necessary are really just high-level attention and focus. I think a greater degree of coordination, one of the things that I was struck by when I was in government is how much stuff was going on that other agencies was, were unaware of. So a degree of centralization, a plan of action that's probably implemented a little bit from the White House. You can't really implement stuff you know, kind of government-wide, David, as you well know, from the State Department, there's going to have to be sort of a driving vision of this is where we want to go, and we have to bring these capabilities together. And we have a lot in the U.S. government that that I think more than we realize, and there's more stuff going on that is constructive along these lines. I think your larger proposition, though, about events conspiring elsewhere is just undeniable. And so there has to be an element of this that is um, that is higher level in the U.S. government. And so I think we've never suffered from an ability to implement U.S.-China diplomacy, and that always continues um, at the White House and elsewhere, but it is this construct of a Asian-wide, you know, kind of agenda that has to be articulated publicly and implemented subsequently is, is really left for the next administration. I do believe... Look, look the, the difference between Asia and other regions, no country in, no region in the world is more accepting of American leadership and engagement than Asia. They want us there. They need us there. And so that's a great open door for us to be able to take advantage of. And I think I would say that, that the, the biggest concern that Asians had about the pivot was that, or the rebalance, was they were they wanted it so badly they were afraid that it wouldn't be continued. And now it's really up to the next administration to to make the strategic commitment that this is going to be an enduring part of American strategy going forward. Would it be a fair critique to say that when you go to the Middle East, you hear many of our allies there say, we think the U.S. would be more committed today in the Middle East if they weren't so focused on the pivot and the move to Asia. When you go to Europe, they say, what do you mean pivot? You know, you're, that suggests turning back on us. And as I recall at various moments, that was what led to the, the, the substitution of the word rebalancing uh, for the pivot, although I, they forgot to send you the memo before you put the title on the book. right? And then you get to Asia, and you have just what you said at the opening, which was, where are the Americans? Why aren't they committed here more? That's sort of a you-can't-win scenario. Well, look, it, it, it is a – what you've just laid out is a clarion call for really you know, engaged, purposeful leadership on the part of the United States – um, in the period ahead. I don't think we've faced a period like this in some time. And, and I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to require some really strategic ordering. And I, I would say number one on the list is, is actually Europe. I think making clear that, that we need a strong, um, durable 
committed set of relationships at Europe at this time after Brexit is really job one and followed by trying to figure out how we're going to position ourselves in these conflicts. And so the, the uh, in the Middle East, I, I, I do believe that there's not enough time and attention to, to, uh, to step up our game in, in Asia, but it's going to be very hard, David. And so I, this is not meant to say, gee, this is easy stuff. A lot of the lower hanging fruit has been picked. And so now it's about institution building. It's about ensuring that there's a commercial dimension uh, to, um, to our engagement strategy. It's stepping up our high level diplomacy and our consultations. It's also finding that balance in the US-China relationship, which has elements of cooperation, but inevitable areas of tension. Let's talk for uh, a moment about trade because it's so critical to this. Jeez, yeah, it turns out time's leave. up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kurt suddenly remembered he had, a, yeah, he had an urgent okay. appointment elsewhere. So um, remarkable presidential campaign in that all of the major candidates, even before you got down to um, Secretary uh, Clinton and Donald Trump, but if you include Sanders in it and many of the other Republicans, all spoke out against TPP at various moments, at various levels of sincerity, and we won't let you go. We won't force you to probe uh, too, too deep into that. But what that does tell you is that however TPP works out, whether it gets through in a, in a lame duck session, whether it's kicked over to a, a, a Clinton or a Trump administration, um, we're probably past the era where we can or even should be out negotiating these giant trade agreements that take years to get done. And by the time you get them done, they, the problems they address bear very little resemblance to the economies that have evolved since that time in the United States, in Asia, in Europe. So what's your vision about how you take that forward? You wouldn't want to go through this kind of TPP experience again, even if it does pass. Yeah, and I, I take your point, and, you know, we're not going to rehearse. You know, I, I think the opposition that Secretary Clinton has very carefully laid out on TPP is a little bit different than the sort of the broad side. Yeah, that, completely. The, but completely so, so, but and, and I'm not going to... But the fact of the matter I, is, but I, I take your point. these candidates no, I take, are I take coming out here making and a big case for so, it. So I would just say simply a few things. First of all, there is an undeniable commercial requirement on the part of the United States, and I'll tell you... At a very base level, what we have seen in the last 20 years is the greatest accumulation of wealth and rising middle class in history across Asia, right? And it's a remarkable achievement of which the United States has played a role in by helping create this operating system that has given Asia the best 40 years of its life, right? And it's freedom of navigation, peaceful resolution of disputes, sanctity of contracts, a, a, an operating system like a computer that, that has been very good for the United States, but other countries as well. I, I would say that sustaining that going forward is going to be essential. And part of that is a recognition that well, if, if you look at it from you know eighty thousand feet, David, the last twenty or thirty years has been about large amounts of American capital going to China, a lot of manufacturing, and much of that coming to the United States, and that has created some imbalances. And going forward, for the United States to create better jobs um, and uh, better opportunities, we're going to have to sell more goods and services in Asia. And Asian countries are going to have to allow us to do that. That is an essential feature of the next phase of commercial engagement in Asia. And um, that requires hard-nosed, tough diplomacy and a recognition that this will lead to greater connectivity interdependence and um, uh, global stability. Now that's hard, Nash economic nationalism's on the rise, but I think this is just an undeniable feature of the way forward. I, I was struck, David, the things that I often heard, you know, when you're in government, you hear a lot of criticism, a lot of things that don't go well, that are not effective. What I heard more than anything else about from businesses that they appreciated was something that I didn't really think was that big of a deal, an APEC, 
business card that allows people who are doing business to travel more efficiently through Asia. I got hundreds of people saying, boy, that's a good basic step that we can build on going forward. It's because anybody who stood in the customs line anyone, at Bangkok Airport. Exactly, yeah, right. Yeah. So, <laughs> but but, but I, I think it's going to be finding some initiatives like this that still suggest that the United States is engaged, understands that Asians are not just looking for a strong defense commitment on the part of the United States. They're looking for an open, optimistic, engaged, innovative commercial partner. And that's what we've got to, that's the challenge we've got to meet. And one last before we open it up to all. In the interviews that I did with Mr. Trump, what was most remarkable to me, what sort of jumped out the most, was that while groups like this talk in terms of alliances and building relationships that we're going to have to draw on for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, his view of the world is very transactional. No big surprise there. He's been a real estate developer and, you know, you move from one project to the next and the relationships may come back together or you may never see those folks again. It's different from the kind of business that you were doing in, in Asia and even that reporters do in, in uh, my time living there. Um, and that's what led to his comments that if there isn't more contribution by Japan and South Korea, which make some of the largest contributions of any of our allies to American Japan, troop support. Japan makes the largest. And, and Japan does the largest, and South Korea is, does, does pretty heavily, heavily as well, that he would let them build nuclear weapons, that we might pull back and so forth. Even if he is defeated... Japan and South Korea are going to think that represents a piece of thinking that may be at least 40% of the American populace. Um, do you believe that? And how would you persuade them otherwise? Just given the fact that even if he doesn't win, that is, that, that is a sentiment that you've heard yeah. repeated a lot. You know, David, it's, it's very tempting to give you just a glib answer. But I, I have to say, I think that's the central challenge. I think the central challenge is not going to be about North Korean nuclear you know, programs and what our strategy is. Our central challenge is going to be to, first of all, summon the political will to make clear to our own public what we're about. Like, I just give you guys a sense. When we talk about like Asia and strategy, normally the president gives a speech when he travels to Asia, when he's out in Asia, he gives a speech in Japan or in Australia or whatever. Increasingly, that speech needs to be given in the United States, right? You gotta give that at home to explain what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it. And David, all the opinion polls, including some very good stuff done in by the New York Times, suggest that the American public is ready for that and already understands the magnitude of what we're facing and the need to shift our focus and engage going forward. Um, so I think a degree of domestic reassurance and explanation is required. Going forward then, look, um, do, you, do I think there are more concerns in Asia about the United States than we've seen in a long time? Yes, I do. But I also think we have some history of being able to navigate through it. The fact is that what happened in 1975 was an enormous shock throughout Asia, the, the unseemly retreat of the United States suddenly uh, after the fall of Saigon. And then the renegotiations of the bases and the largely you know, moving out of, Asia, of the United States of Asia. I think we can take purposeful steps that will help persuade a, a wary Asia that we think that these commitments are important and that they're good for us and good for you. And, and I just, I, David, that's the challenge at hand and that's what diplomacy is about, is making the case and have it align with your self-interest. The great, the great benefit here is that the self-interest is just undeniable as opposed to some places in which there is a clear requirement for the use of troops and money and stuff like that. But even in the best of circumstances, it's sometimes hard to paint a picture of why that's gonna make a positive difference over time. 
Great. Well, let's go um, get some questions out from the audience. We'll start right here on the on the aisle. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Kurt, can you say a few words about the Philippines and how the new administration might think about the Philippines in light of the very concerning recent statements? This is our good friend, uh, 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 Jamie, and he's got himself a wonderful uh, book um, just published about a week ago. I always get the name line. It's not interlude. What is it again? Eternal Sonata, which I highly recommend, and he's a great Asian expert as well. So thank you for the the, the question. So y you notice that a lot of American officials, Jamie, are kind of dodging this question and trying to say, well, look, under, beneath the surface, there's still cooperation going on, and nothing fundamental has changed in terms of the alliance. I think that all may be true. But my own personal view is that what's happening in the Philippines is starting to raise larger questions and concerns. I mean, the extrajudicial killings, uh, some of the language and stuff, it just makes it really hard in the current environment to work with the Philippines. And and there, on one level, I think what Duarte is indicating, if you look carefully in some of the interpretations, he's basically saying, we wanna, we wanna maximize our diplomatic leverage, not just with the United States, but with Russia and China. Basically, wanting the Philippines to be more active, to be more responsible, and to play a role in its own security through direct negotiations and engagements, we have to support that. That's a smart thing, and we want the Philippines to thrive. The, but, but at the same time, I don't believe the Philippine people, and I don't believe Filipino Americans are comfortable with how the president is referring to the United States and to our own president. I just, I, I think it's so far beyond the bounds of what is diplomatically acceptable. Uh, and also the statements about the killings and about how it will go forward and Hitler, the, much of this creates a context that's gonna be very hard for us to operate in. And so this idea that no, no, we'll ignore this and maintain quietly our sort of military and strategic um, uh, operational uh, uh, activities intact, I think is going to be difficult. So and far you have not seen the State Department come out and yeah. make the kinds of statements on the extrajudicial killings that the U.S. frequently makes if it's other countries that are not yes. close allies. Is that going to have to change? Look, I mean, it, you know, we often face situations in Asia and elsewhere, we've seen it in Egypt, where you, you, you know, you have an alliance with a country, it's important, and that you have a, a, a set of steps, either a military coup or steps that have taken place that puts the United States in an awkward position. I would be one that would be quite clear about our values and our approach. And I think some of the things that are going on in the Philippines, David, I, I'm out of government. I'm not, I just wrote a book. I just think we have to be clear that are not in our strategic interest. And if not, then what is it that we stand for, okay. right? So what is it that we believe in? And and I think uh, there has to be an expression of concern and regret. Okay, in the back there, PJ. Oh. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Cammy but I'm with the Pakistani Spectator, and my question is: Isn't uh, Donald Trump more patriotic than any other politician? Given he is very careful about criticizing uh, the people who are not, you know, very democratic in Asian countries. It means he cares more about American trade and making money for America rather than this something called democracy. And about related questions, since I work for the Pakistani Spectator, and you mentioned something about Afghanistan, we are leaving Afghanistan as a f failed state because Pakistan and Kashmir, they are very integral part. Unless you resolve Kashmir, you cannot resolve Afghanistan. As an American taxpayer, I feel more concerned about Afghanistan than I feel about Middle East. Even we have spent more money in Middle East, but Bibi Netanyahu doesn't have any foreign account. Pakistan, okay, Afghanistan, so I politician. The, I think we've got the two questions. How can we resolve Afghanistan issue without resolving Kashmir issue, given that part of the world is owned or ruled by crooks, international crooks. Thanks. Why don't you give it? And to, give the microphone up there to PJ. Do you want to? PJ, you were going to. No, it's right here. Right here. And then I'll, I'll make sure I get to that question. Uh, Kurt, um, 
how do you assess uh, China's reaction to the ruling in The Hague of the Nine Dash Line, and where are they now, and yeah. where would you like to see them go, and where is they're likely to go? Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll take that question and get to the very interesting question of the gentleman from the Pakistan press. Um, PJ, I think, I think the Chinese were surprised, frankly, and if you've read most of the rulings that come from The Hague in this area, they use, they are often... Uh, Indecipherable. Would yeah, that be or, 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 you know, <laughs> uh, little something for everyone, uh, not completely clear. This was uh, as, this is like a ringing bell and quite decisive. And I think it surprised Chinese friends. And I think, I think it has caused them to, to step back and sort of reconsider on the way forward. And I think they're in the period of rethinking their position. Um, I, not their position in terms, they're, they're not in this circumstance it's about to revise their thinking at, at large, but I think they're thinking now more about their tactics and the way forward. I, I think the U.S. position should be consistent here, PJ. Um, so for many people that look at the South China Sea and they say, gee, it's just a million miles from here, it's not important. Why would we focus on this? When in fact, if you look at as a waterway, as a waterway, this 9,000 mile area, as a waterway, by tonnage, about 35 to 40 percent of global trade, and by value, between 30 and 40 percent travel through it every year. So it's hugely important as a transshipment point, and it's as important to China in that respect than any other country, right? It's either oil or unfinished or finished goods that sail through that uh, arena. Look, the it's hard to disaggregate what's going on. It's very complicated, obviously. I think we are going to continue to have disputes on territorial issues in Asia. Um, they're like the mumps. And when they come up, you know you've got other problems, right? You have these disputes between Japan and Russia, uh, left over from the Second World War between Japan and uh, uh, South Korea, between Ch Japan and China, and between a host of countries in the South China Sea. So this is not specifically unique to China, but China has taken more steps with respect to trying to um, uh, uh, make these uh, their island claims more substantial through um, uh, efforts to build them up and to cement them in. The, the real issue for the United States is the issue of freedom of navigation through these areas. And that's where I think the focus needs to remain. And I think we would ask, I think the most important thing going forward is for China to clarify its position. And that's been hard. Like, it's not clear, in some circumstances, they've suggested that this entire 9,000-mile area should be treated as territorial waters. That is antithetical to anything that any country would, would ascribe to as part of the law of the sea or anything else. And we, like we've done um, for decades, will continue to take steps to sail responsibly through those areas. And I would continue, I would expect that to continue. I would not make a big deal of it. I would not have it on the front page of the New York Times. I would just try to continue that process and make clear to Chinese friends, at, at the heart is a persuasion campaign. I believe what the United States is about is more a 21st century vision in which countries in Asia are gonna to need to share power and responsibility and that we have created, again, this operating system that has been very good for all countries and very good for China. I would, I, I would unabashedly make the argument that no power has helped China more in the last 40 years than the United States. Openness of our market, support for their leadership, commitment to high-level engagement, um, investment, uh, training, you name it. It's been very substantial, and we have much to be proud of that in that going forward. I think right now China is flirting with a diff different vision for Asia in the future that frankly is more 19th century in which there are spheres of influence, countries that are closer, have uh, you know, a, a special uh, kind of role within a larger Chinese framework. And I think down that track lies outcomes that are not good for Asia, but 
as uh, it relates to China, PJ, are not good for China either. And so I think making that argument, sustaining it, and making clear that this is not just simply a bilateral disagreement between the United States and China, but other countries want to ensure a mechanism and a process pertains that will allow for the continuation of the peace and prosperity that has been so significant for Beijing and other countries in the last several years. And to our Pakistan friend, I look, uh, I, I don't think, um, uh, I believe Secretary Clinton is very patriotic. I worked with her, um, uh, her commitment, her determination. Look, I just say for personally, I've been in the Navy, I've been uh, in business, I've been in academia, I've had a million bosses. I've never had a better boss, never. I'm never, I'm not the easiest person sometimes. I'm pretty out there, entrepreneurial. I've never had a person who gave me more leash, who had more trust and confidence in me, that treated me with greater respect. So for me, I just, I can't say enough, all right? And I worked with her, and I worked with her in the hardest circumstances. I don't want to say anything, you make your own judgments about Mr. Trump. And then, look, I, I, I can't get into the issues associated uh, with Kashmir. I would simply say, on, on the one hand, I'm a very strong supporter of the American engagement with India. I think it's something that's important. It's a critical component of the, um, the, the pivot. And I think India playing a larger role in Asia is in our best strategic interests. I also believe that um, one of the things that we're seeing of late is China's actions more in um, the Middle East and South Asia. PJ came to talk to him about this. I think this is very much in American strategic interests. If China does more to bring peace and stability to Afghanistan, to Pakistan, to other countries in the Middle East through its um, uh, investments and engagements, this is a win-win for us. And so it's not, aha, China's going to be more active in the Middle East and they're going to displace the United States. No, this will be complementary to what we're doing as well. Okay, so we've got about 10 more minutes, so I'm going to call on a few people and ask for some and I'll do short better. questions I'll and do short answers. answers. Yeah. I'll do better answering. Hi, folks. My name is Patrick Mendes. Um, quick question. Uh, I is to say whether central CPC is implicitly or explicitly encouraging SOEs to work with uh, American companies, especially the banking sector, to acquire American companies or get their part of their portion of their power, like in Astoria uh, and also the Virginia Ham. Uh, and numerous other things. And now they are building a, a road between uh, Las Vegas and uh, uh, Los Angeles. So that's the other way to count uh, TPP. We don't need to go to the formal channel and governments don't trade. People do or the companies do. How do you respond to this county strategy that's already taking place? It has uh, not only the commercial implication for the US, but also national security implication. Yeah, so look, I, I would simply say that we've seen a dramatic increase in Chinese investment in the United States. The vast majority of that investment goes smoothly and easily, and I believe it is creating greater interdependence between our two countries. That interdependence is uncomfortable at times for both China and the United States, but it is our ticket to the future. Um, and so if you're talking about seeing more Chinese investment in agriculture, in technology, in, in health-related fields. I think the more that we have these kinds of interactions, um, as long as they do not compromise American strategic interests, I believe it is in the best interest of both countries. I think the bigger challenge, if I can say, is not that. I think the United States is a relatively open playing field. I think we're reaching a stage now in which Chinese friends sometimes in meetings will say there's no role for American technology companies in China. That just can't work. That can't work. China needs to understand that the ballast in our boat 
is the U.S. business uh, 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 community and their commitment to China. There has to be a role for Chinese, for American firms going forward in China to maintain that forward momentum in the relationship. Right here. Hi, Tara. The Philippines about you know the things that you were describing they're so horrible so the question is how what is the strategic importance of the Philippines for the US and is there a way for the US to work around the Philippines maybe by relying on bases in Vietnam or some other solution well look we don't have bases in the Philippines um, and we have visiting agreements I don't anticipate that the United States would, will have bases um, in any country in Southeast Asia. I do believe our activities, our training, our engagement will increase generally. Um, I think, um, in truth, what we have seen in the last few years is a renaissance in U.S.-Philippine relations that was very substantial under the Aquino government. And I believe that we had surmounted some of the challenges that you have in a post-colonial relationship that was um, reflected in greater respect, greater engagement, and um, I was quite hopeful about the future of the relationship going forward. I think you'd have to say right now you have concerns. I mean, I just, I, it's very hard to not recognize that these kinds of statements and insults directed at a leader of your own country you know, it, it creates an environment that it's hard to do business. And so I think the hope in some quarters is that we'll be able to maintain some momentum on the political and security side well beneath the surface uh, at the same time that you have a very corrosive set of actions, both rhetoric and extrajudicial issues. I think over time, over time, it's going to create um, contradictions that will be difficult to reconcile. And so I'm just simply saying here that I, I think the United States has to express concerns by what's happening. And we have to put our, um, uh, uh, put, uh, uh, our position on, a, on the rule of law and to speak out against uh, certain activities that are antithetical to what we would hope to see in any functioning democracy. Right here in the front row. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Garrett Mitchell, and I want to just pose a simple question, and that is, leaving aside criticisms that get hurled every day at Obama and foreign policy in Syria and North Korea and Iran, et cetera, I'm interested in your perspective on, uh, on how foreign policy is getting made these days. Yeah. Uh, and in simple terms, the rap is uh, that it's essentially become a, a White House game, and that what defense and state have to say is interesting but not particularly relevant. I know that's an overstatement, but what I'm interested in knowing is whether you think it's axiomatic that the making of, of American foreign policy today is predominantly a White House-centric function, A. B, if that's the case, is that is that good, bad, or simply the way it is? And C, if it's not, uh, are there things that the 45th president of the United States ought to think about uh, that might make some difference there? Yeah. Great question. Great observations, great questions. And you heard it about the, the, the policy making. Um, Dave and I were, uh, and one of the things that, that, that Jonathan helped convene this summer was a discussion about, about the the actual operation of the executive branch and how to think about in terms of the formulation and execution of American foreign policy. I, I think there is a general recognition that number of trends point towards a degree of centralization, right? The 24-hour news cycle that requires, you know, immediate responses. I think what is not as well understood is that the process of staffing the U.S. government at senior levels fully to get people confirmed can take a year or two. That's a long time when you want to hit the ground running. And so it's natural for some of that power to gravitate to the White House where you can get people in and to work quickly. Um, and so I think that's the second thing. I think 
um, it is also the case that um, there is a tension between a White House that sets objectives and policy parameters and a White House that becomes deeply operational, right? And so the hope would be that you set the direction for policy at the White House and a lot of the implementation is done in other agencies. But I think you, uh, sir, are exactly well, right. This certainly is a pretty operational NSC it, it right now. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disputing, and I think there are a lot of um, reasons why that has taken place. My own sense is that one of the advantages of Secretary Clinton is that she's been on the other end of this. She knows what it's like to be at the State Department and knows, you know, you you want to, you know, you want to maneuver, get things done, have some ability to to function independently, but at the same time that you've got to take strategic direction from the White House. I think um, I, I think invariably the tension is going to be to bring things in, and you have to take real concerted steps to make sure that appropriate responsibilities are hand handled elsewhere. Let's see the question right here in the end. Uh, thank you. Uh, John Zhao from American University would like to see you back in the future. Thank you. Uh, my question is back to the pivot itself. Uh, obviously, it's a target on China. So US-China. Uh, crisis prevention and the crisis management. That's my question. If you look at now, relatively quiet, but two, three months ago, yeah. we do see uh, ships and over there, and also our Pacific commander saying, tomorrow there will be a war. So my question is whether there are different approaches between Pentagon or state or White House in this direction. And finally, one very quick comment. You, earlier you mentioned Europe first. So I, I would like to hear you have uh, more uh, uh, about uh, what do you mean by Europe first? Uh, we are now going to rank, right? Is Asia Pacific, yeah, not, Europe. I, I didn't mean to suggest a ranking. I'm talking about, about where the urgent efforts are going to take place. And my sense is that there is a crisis of confidence and uncertainty in Europe that really requires a degree of American focus at the outset. And I think that's largely a result of both refugees surging into uh, Europe, the Brexit vote, and other uncertainties associated with Russia. So I think a purposeful initial American engagement in Europe is essential. I mean, I'd, I'd be curious to hear David talk about this, but I'm saying this at, from an Asian perspective. I'm not, I, I work on the world too, but I just think that this is very important for us going forward. The action plan for the United States and China, I really appreciate your question, involves a number of things. So I think sometimes on the US-China level, we spend too much time on what the headline is. Is it a great strategic partnership, new great power relationship? What really is important for the United States and China in the next period ahead is building more habits of cooperation. Actually, and we do very little together in the world. We don't do very much aid and assistance. We do not work in humanitarian support or, you know, uh, you know, disaster relief or pir anti-piracy. We need to create habits of, of, of cooperation. Now, I will tell you, I was involved in a lot of these discussions. Chinese friends do not make it easy. They, they throw up many roadblocks about why cooperation would be hard. We have to move through those and develop um, that capacity. Secondly, I, I do agree that creating the, the, the greatest challenge to the US-China relationship at the tactical level is misunderstanding and miscalculation. And that we could find ourselves in a local situation where a fishing captain or someone's just had a bad day, very much like the P3 incidents that David wrote about in 2001, could repeat itself but also spur higher tensions. It is, it is incumbent on us to create mechanisms for crisis management and communication that will allow for these things to be handled at a lower level and not spur, uh, spiral out of control. Again, we've tried that with Chinese friends. It's hard, they have a lot of political concerns, but ultimately it's building these mechanisms 
to create a mature um, U.S.-China relationship that can be durable and withstand these kinds of accidents or incidents that you described? Well, Kurt, thank you. I think um, one of the things that I think we all treasure the most in public officials and public officials who loop back to the private sector is an ability to go deal with the immediate issues of the day, but then also to go up to 30,000 feet and ask that great question, what are we trying to get done here? Yeah. Uh, and I think you've done that spectacularly for us for the uh, past uh, hour and, and some on time. And the pivot does it spectacularly. It, it both gives you some fabulous insights into um, what Kurt was handling in those first four years of the administration when he was assistant secretary, but it also backs off to explain the greater American project in Asia and the American project as the Asians see it, which is even in some ways yeah. more fascinating. So I thank you for the book. I thank you for the conversation. I thank all of you for coming. And uh, I think Kurt's going to be stepping out and signing some books uh, as well yeah. out the hallways. So, so, so my that. aunt, uh, so I got a call from the publisher. Dave and I sh share the same publisher. And the uh, same editor. Same editor, only his are 100 times more than mine. So I think <laughs> my aunt and her friend bought two books last week in mm -hmm. Fresno, California. Mm -hmm. And I got a call, there was a dramatic increase. So mm -hmm. an increase of about 50%. So don't gotta worry. Got to be careful that because the friend could always send it back. You know? That's right. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you.